Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is a joint um, uh, presentation to the Senate Finance and Senate Appropriations Committee. So Senator Cummings and I are co-chairing uh, um, the presentation, um, but most of it is going to be provided um, by our economist, Tom Cavett, who's had a very busy day um, presenting our updated revenue uh, forecast, which we've just accepted at the e-board meeting um, with the governor, what, about an hour ago? About an hour ago. So, uh, and some of you who are on um, uh, joint fiscal also got a preview of this as well. So um, we are um, going to go through uh, the update. And so um, it's, it's encouraging and um, I will turn it over to uh, Tom Cavett who, um, uh, am I, here. I'm, I know he's here, I'm not seeing him. Yeah, he's oh. right beside he, he just doesn't have the waves or the snow behind him this I time. Can, I can fix that if you want. <laughs> no, but the bookshelves are fine. All right, so, yeah. uh, Tom, do you want to, um, and uh, there is the, the document I believe is over 50 pages. It's the usual, very detailed with lots of graphs looking at, you know, trends, um, property uh, sales, uh, electric usage. It's quite, um, quite detailed. So um, if you really want to get into the, um, the data behind um, what we're going to get today, um, it's available, and I think Chrissy, you um, sent it out to everyone. Or yes, yes, I did. Okay. All right. So why don't we get started then with Tom? Yeah, I actually think it might be best not to be too far down in the weeds because I think most of you have heard some semblance of this at least once, and some maybe three or even four times. So. I think it's, it might be most useful just for a very quick overview and then just do Q&A and see what things there are questions about. And then we can drill into any part of it you're interested in. The, you know, we always review thousands and thousands of pieces of data and, and we've created some new data uh, just because the standard economic statistics that we use are almost all backward looking. And, so much so that with a situation like this that's moving so quickly, we can't really get a read on things without better and, and different information. So uh, yeah, there, there, there are some examples of some of the data that we've been able to uh, create with uh, the utilities in the state who've been, by the way, extraordinarily cooperative. Uh, nobody had to go along with our uh, you know, request for information or anything else. And uh, uh, just the way people have come together in a lot of different spheres, um, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, the administration, the tax department has been absolutely phenomenal in processing enormous amounts of information uh, that, that we've needed that's different than usual and done it working remotely and been incredibly productive um, the uh, a group that's doing the epidemiological analysis uh, under Commissioner Pichak also has done a phenomenal amount of work that we've relied on heavily. Uh, and there are a bunch of charts that are in the, the deck there that, that come from, uh, from his shop. We, we meet regularly with, with them to go over the epidemiological developments because this is not a forecast that's based on economics as we've traditionally done. This is that you know the whole the whole path that we're looking at for revenues and 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 economic activity is a function of the pandemic, primarily, and secondarily a function of federal government offsets uh, and federal government fiscal and monetary policy to try to. Uh, uh, blunt the negative impacts of what's required to deal with a, a health crisis. So it's, it's a very non-traditional forecast and a great deal is unknown. Um, I mean, that's always the case that there are unknown things, but they usually fall within pretty narrow bands and you can 
quantify risks and you know look at that. Uh, right now, they're all over the map. I mean, it's anybody's guess as to how the pandemic develops. Um, uh, you know, if you look back a month ago, oh, everybody's reopening, looks good. Uh, then some areas really ran into trouble reopening. They've had to close back up. And you've seen a lot of metrics that are more coincident start to flatten off and even drop. Not so much in Vermont, but we're not an island. We're affected by uh, the rest of the country too. So these two big areas are what are driving everything that we've got in this forecast. But just, you know, I, I, I said a couple of times, I don't think this thing will have a shelf life, you know, of, of anywhere close to six months, which is the normal forecast cycle. Um, but it, it's potentially already out of date if nothing happens in Washington um, with a next tranche of, of spending. And that's anybody's guess as to what's going on uh, down there. It seems, you know, it was in everybody's interest to do something. And we had baked in a, a pretty conservative, what we thought was conservative, maybe trillion and a half or so compromise next round. And, uh, and that that would include some state, unrestricted state and federal government money as well. And that, uh, uh, you know, is an assumption that's uh, not playing out. So uh, that alone would have enormous impacts on what we're looking at. Uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal today, uh, some of you may have seen, uh, quoting uh, Mark Zandi of Moody's, who we work with in developing the state uh, economic model. And his estimates are that without uh, a second round and the executive actions are a drop in the bucket compared with what was assumed in this last model run. Uh, without, without that support, um, uh, particularly with state local governments, that component alone, uh, which you know was probably uh, 500 billion or so, uh, you pull that out and you've got about 4 million fewer jobs and about three percentage points off GDP over the next two years. That's a big, that's a big move just in and of itself. Uh, you know, they're, they're just these cascading momentous uh, things that are hanging out there and very uncertain. So, uh, you know, we're standing on quicksand uh, with this and the decisions you make that are based on these numbers are gonna be comparably uncertain. So it wouldn't surprise me if we've got to revisit this uh, more frequently. Typically when there's a lot of uncertainty, you increase the frequency of forecasting and you start to do scenario planning uh, so that you have different contingencies. Um, so far, the state has not done a lot of uh, scenario forecasting, but um, uh, you know there, there's just such variability and it could affect uh, your decisions immediately. But I, I think um, uh, there's a lot still to come. So, um, you know, the, just just broad brush. That's the, you know, the essence of the forecast is that uh, there's a tremendous amount that that's, that's unknown. We're watching developments of the pandemic closely. We're watching federal responses closely, and those are the things that are going to make the difference. Uh, uh, you know, not uh, underlying economic fundamentals, and not uh, not really state policy uh, at this point. Um, Tom, it might be helpful. Um, I, I don't know if, if uh, Chrissy can bring it up, but the page in your report that just uh, the bar graph that shows it all is on the left hand side of the line now. Yeah, but, that's page, um, that's page that, 15, Chrissy. That summarizes sort of uh, um, the, the revenue forecast I, as it relates to January. So that might be probably the first place that people would want to say, well, what does this all mean in terms of the revenue? Yeah, so that's page 15. Okay, 15. give me one moment and I'll pull that right up for you. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the typical chart that we've got where we have the next two fiscal years broken out by fund change relative to the last formally adopted uh, forecast. Uh, so one page past that, uh, I think is where we're at, yeah. yeah. So, 
you know, you can see everything's to the left of the zero line. Um, it's actually a little better than the June projections and quite a bit better than some of the even earlier May and March uh, uh, potential uh, projections. Several things have happened. I mean, at, at the start, the epidemiological models were suggesting that the shutdown might need to last through June. So we were conservatively, you know, saying that, you know, that might, might, might be the parameter that we'd be uh, assuming we'd see these impacts. That uh, uh, in Vermont, especially, uh, developed more favorably so that reopening could happen earlier. Um, uh, then also the deferred revenues for personal income and corporate income that would have been in April, uh, uh, May and June were higher than uh, uh, expected when they came in in July. Uh, uh, it also came in very, very slowly. We were getting mail that was postmarked the 15th uh, at the end of the month, which is unusual, probably shows the stress that the, the Montpelier post office was under in, in getting that deluge of returns uh, w w in a stress situation. But uh, that was really unusual too, to be getting so much money so late, because even early in that process, it didn't look you know, that, that far out of sync. Uh, from what we know about that event too, it was very top heavy. Um, uh, there were a relatively small number of, of really large events that uh, reverberated through a lot of uh, uh, tax liability channels and uh, gave rise to uh, extraordinary amounts of income. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's been an increasing feature of both, both personal income and corporate tax revenues for a while but it was really on display in fiscal 20. But that, that created some good news in terms of uh, uh, both the fiscal 20 close um, uh, and, and also just gave us a better, uh, a higher starting point without quite as long a shutdown. Um, so, you know, this is what we're looking at right now that adds up to about $275 million in, in you know, across all those funds in, fiscal 21 and about 158 million in fiscal 22. Uh, that's not jump change, but it, it, you know, it has been worse and it still could be worse. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things that can happen in all directions. So uh, certainly without the enormous amount of money that's uh, uh, come to the state and federal transfer payments, we would not have seen the, the year end strength either in a couple of other categories. And that also uh, spills over some into fiscal 21, although a lot of that uh, assistance will dissipate pretty quickly, particularly the unemployment benefits. Um, some of the other uh, uh, payments, the CARES Act stuff, it's not fully spent or even fully committed. And uh, uh, savings rates have also gone up. I mean, this is, you know, you really see this, this dichotomy in, in, in impacts and who's affected. And, and not all this money was terribly well targeted. The, the idea, I think, was to get it out quickly. But um, there, there's a lot of it that landed in places that, you know, weren't affected by COVID and to individuals and, and businesses that, were either minimally affected or not affected. And so what, what you see is on the one hand, monies that went to people that were unemployed and, and had, had really high levels of impact uh, that just kept them afloat, that kept a roof over their head and food on the table um, and, and essential basic needs covered. Then you had also people that um, could just bank the money. So the savings rate nationally in the quarter went from 8% to 20%. You had a lot of high-end purchases, um, automobiles especially, but also housing, real estate uh, was really juiced by a lot of that, um, uh, that money as well. Uh, 
you know, the PPP money had a pretty low bar for qualification. It, it really was sort of more at, if you felt at risk uh, uh, to be impacted, you didn't have to show uh, actual loss. Uh, whereas with something like unemployment, you had to lose your job before you uh, qualified. And with some of the state programs that um, are providing assistance to businesses, they're, they're, you know, they're basing it on actual year-over-year -year losses. So um, if you look at the PPP money and where it went, there are a lot of sectors like the leisure and, and hospitality sector, which is probably the single most affected sector, is about sixth on the list of of where that money went. Um, and, and it actually didn't make sense for a lot of people to take uh, just the way it was structured. If you were really down and out and not necessarily expecting to come back, uh, you didn't need a two month lifeline. You needed something different and, and you know, to take that wasn't advantageous. So, um, you know, the, the money's out there, it's showing up in a lot of places. Um, it's, it's certainly stimulating the economy and it certainly underpins what would be an even worse revenue forecast uh, than if it hadn't been there. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what we're looking at in aggregate in the numbers, so pretty severe. Let um, uh, open it up for questions. I guess when we look at this, this is relative to January, um, but for those of us who have been had the benefit of interim forecasts. In fact, this is an improvement in terms of revenues over what we um, were having presented to us in June. So um, although it's not, um, it's not on the right side of the graph, um, it certainly is a much better scenario than what we were um, projecting even in June by, I guess it was about, according to, um, the joint fiscal chart about $54 million on the plus side between um, all the funds. So um, at least it was moving in a good direction for, uh, for, um, for us coming back in August. So uh, questions of the, uh, from anyone listening? Um, yes, Senator Starr. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting, so how much how much are you, we projected to be behind when we put this next uh, budget together next week? Um, sure. Well, this, this is an add-on. It's something we got a joint fiscal this morning. Um, and it's a sheet that, that was pre, um, uh, prepared by Stephanie Barrett um, that walks us through where, what we're going to be dealing with when we come back. And it's, it's really, it's manageable. I guess that's what I would say. Everybody's been concerned that it would be, have to be um, very substantial. And I don't know, Stephanie, are you on? Yeah, I, I am on. Okay, I don't know if you've got that sheet. We could put it up quickly, but maybe we can go back to Tom's projection. But what it does is take what we have from closeout. It looks at, um, the revenues that uh, were received in July that ordinarily would have been paid um, in the prior fiscal year. Remember we had that delay. Yeah. Uh, those revenues turned out to be um, really better than we thought. So we, we've got between carry forward between um, those 20 revenues. Uh, we're, we're coming into the August budget process um, uh, with this, better forecast and then with these other sources of revenues in a way that we think we can, um, uh, that we, we'll survive this. And there are a yeah. couple of things that we can run through very, very quickly, but I, I don't want to take Tom's time, but Stephanie, yeah. if you want to run this through very quickly, we other know that um, there's that a one funding source, it's going to be Medicaid, that, uh, that bump would continue. So there are ways in, if you look at the bottom, that 66.6, um, that there are some uh, ways in which that can be um, uh, addressed without, um, without slashing and burning, so to speak. So yes. we'll put that sheet out for you to uh, refer to, but it walks you through 
in terms of um, the general fund forecast. You can see the 182 that um, Tom was talking about, then what we had for revenues available and so forth. So I, I think it's really important to take the revenue projections and then see what we have here um, to help with that um, as we come back in, in the <clears throat> third week, fourth week, whatever week of August, August 25th. So Is Senator McCormick, I'm sorry, Bobby, go ahead. I was just going to say that's uh, great news and uh, you don't need to fool with this uh, on my behalf any longer. Okay. We can get on back with Tom. Okay, Senator McCormick, you have a question of Tom? Yes, thanks. Uh, apologies to people who've been doing this in, in joint fiscal and so on. I'm actually just coming back to this now after a six week absence from the issue. I just want to make sure I'm understanding things correctly. Tom, when you mentioned a scenario planning, I take that to mean if X happens, we'll do this. If Y happens, we'll do that. That's what scenario planning is. Right. So there are, there, there are a series of assumptions that underpin every forecast. And yes. if you change those assumptions, you could have scenario A assumes that um, we only get the executive action of uh, additional money and scenario B assumes uh, the House bill flies through or, or, or gets through at uh, north of $2 trillion and here's what the $2 trillion looks like and you do that or you say, we assume that a vaccine uh, is widely distributed uh, in the middle of 2021 or a version that says the middle of 2023. What yeah. And our assumptions are all I guess they're always subject to revision, but in this case, especially so. Just massively so. I mean, just yeah. take, take any one of those things that I just mentioned. What's your guess? Okay, well, you know, it's, thank you. That, that was my understanding. The other thing is, yeah. how are we planning now, we come back, are we planning a budget through the 1st of January or through the end of the fiscal year? Through the end of the I, fiscal year. Through the end. Okay, but we'll be doing a budget adjustment act in January. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah. Hopefully not okay. as many as this year, but yes. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. That's um, all. Thanks. Other questions? I can see Senator Brock, Senator Pearson. This is the first year, like Senator McCormick are hearing it for the first time. Um, any questions or? I, I know it's a hot day. People are, are probably, uh, uh, it's straightforward if you, uh, have a lot of time and um, have trouble going to sleep, then you can read that 50 page report. And it has too many comics in it. Oh. Um, the one thing is that the Ed Fund is also in a much more manageable position oh, than right. when we left. <clears throat> yeah. And this does not count ESSER funds, um, some of which may be able, depending on what each school district does, some of the ESSER funds may be used to supplant money that is currently being paid for with um, ed fund dollars. So that could equally help the situation. And then um, uh, don't forget appropriations. We had allocated a hundred million that we have not appropriated for K through 12, anticipating higher costs um, of startup um, um, in the fall. So it, we've got the ESSER money, but we've got the um, some of the corona relief money that's out there to help us as well. Because there's quite a lot of concern about what would be the academic needs of some of our students um, who um, are not going to respond as well to remote learning or may not have the same um, opportunities in their home setting as some of the other kids. Senator Pearson, you had your hand up. Well, I just, uh, my question was around the Ed Fund. Uh, we've covered it, but am I right uh, that we think there was 38 in reserves and this is yeah. about 60. So, I mean, that's a decision, but potentially compared to where we were at $160 million shortfall, we've come a long way. Oh, absolutely. And I, um, I don't know, did a copy of the uh, latest Ed Fund projections, and of course, that gets back into Tom's revenue because some of that, uh, some of that uh, revenue is coming from um, sales, in, uh, sales tax and 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the strength in the sales tax has been almost entirely internet related. I'll tell you, without the Quill Wayfair money, uh, we'd be in horrendous shape uh, because the brick and mortar stores were hammered and the internet providers, uh, vendors just have been rolling in dough. And uh, so we, we saw probably um, $35 million just in uh, Wayfair Quill uh, vendors and Amazon affiliates. So not including Amazon uh, regular, uh, $35 million in revenue, uh, that, that was really critical to this year's, to fiscal 20 growth. And uh, uh, internet sales, when you include Amazon as a share of total sales and use, is uh, north of 11%. And we hadn't expected that to get there for maybe three years, four years to be at those levels. So um, that component has been really strong as well as building uh, uh, home improvement uh, uh, stores, building material stores. Uh, and of course, grocery stores have also uh, gotten a lot of uh, taxable sales as well as non-taxable. I say to people, um, Toilet paper is taxable, and so this big run on toilet paper. Is I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah, toilet paper is taxable, so you 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 know when people hoard stuff like that, that's tax revenue for the state. Um, <laughs> there's just you know they're spending the money in different places, but it's showing up uh, in in sales and use. So those areas were critical. Without the growth, without without the new revenue from the the Wayfair Quill there would have been a decline in sales and use. As it was, it grew about 4.8%, which was below projections, but it was still uh, uh, positive. Uh, so it's, it's, it's all due to, to that. So, Jane? Yeah, Senator Westman. Um, i just say for Chris is, um, um, Mark Perrault's um, um, Ed Fund sheet is on the um, appropriations website. And and Mark lays it out pretty. It, it's it's the standard um, Ed Fund outlook. Um, um, and so, she, so where we were, as you pointed out, Chris, you know, a few months ago, it's it's so it it once again it appears manageable as opposed to overwhelming. So, um, yes, yeah, that's important, and it's it's out there. Um, Stephanie's sheet, I think, will be out there as well. So. Um, uh, put it all together and it gives you a pretty good sense of where we are right now. Other it's, questions it's all on joint or, fiscal. or um, Brian, um, just want to make sure if you've got a question. No, nope. all seems straightforward. Okay. Um, other high points, Tom, I, I know that at this point, it's, uh, it's hard to remember what you've said to whom, but um, <laughs> it's, um, it's just incredibly these forecasting in this environment is just a whole new uh, um, frontier. I I'm sure. So it's um, um, it's as Senator McCormick says. We'll probably there's if you're a betting person, um, you would want to bet that we're going to have a budget adjustment. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. I I, I I think that's I think that's likely. I mean. Just a couple of things. There, there are these charts on daily consumption of electricity by end user, and um, you know most of the 50 pages of the document um, are just you know full page charts that were instead of embedded in the text, a few here and there. I just put that whole deck in for reference in doing these Zoom sessions, and then sometimes there's a question that comes up that has to do with one and we'll just pull that up. It's not meant to be, you know, part of some presentation uh, uh, document. It's more uh, 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 canvassing all the possible areas that we might get questions from. But it's really interesting because it shows on a daily basis um, the difference between uh, what would be expected in a, a comparable period uh, and we got the utilities to pull this data and then a group in, in Boston called ITRON who does load forecasting for most of the Vermont utilities to normalize the data. So we're looking at apples and apples. What you see though is 
immediately a whole lot more residential consumption of electricity as people are staying home. And, and then a reduction in small commercial and larger commercial industrial. Um, but then you see after that, you know, very low period, mostly April, early May. So late March through early May, uh, th there's there's a significant difference in, in you know five to twenty percent less electricity consumption uh, in the in the uh, business sectors then, but but it's coming back um, more with a large commercial uh, sector than the small, but uh, still there there's a lot more residential electricity consumption. So clearly a lot of people are continuing to work from home. And that could be, the longer this goes on, the more likely that is to be a feature of work in the future. And there are a lot of things that, that will be affected by that. So there, there are a lot of things that are too early to say, yeah, that's definitely how it's gonna work. And here's what's, how it's gonna affect commercial real estate prices or something else. But, but those things are all being talked about and they're all being affected in some way, shape or form. Uh, all the people that are moving to Vermont, uh, you know, because they can work work remotely. I know I've sounded like a broken record over the years saying, you know, internet access and broadband uh, uh, investment for economic development is the most important thing the state can do. Uh, it shows at, at a time like this, because even some really rural, very socially distant areas that uh, hadn't gotten a lot of economic development are, are seeing uh, uh, real estate transactions and interests from out-of-state buyers and things like that that uh, they hadn't seen for a long time. I, can I just comment? Yes. I, yeah, I'd be careful about your uh, residential electricity. Um, if you look at your line goes back down in August, we just had the hottest July in, on record. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, on, I'm on the board at Vermont Electric, and what we saw was a lot of people with air conditioners on. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. So the, the weather adjustment is not a part of it, and we have a whole other set of, of metrics that show uh, with different temperature levels where some of those would be. You still have the biggest impact in differentials being uh, 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 COVID-related, um, but you also have a, a weather factor that's a big part of, of uh, you know, you'll see these weekly fluctuations and they'll be because people are turning on air conditioners and people are buying air conditioners, you know, big ticket items like air conditioners, chest freezers you can't buy, things like that. Uh, it's, it's interesting all the different ways consumption has been redirected. Chicken wire. You can't buy chicken wire in Washington County. <laughs> you can finally in Bennington County, but you're right, Ann. We went for, we couldn't find it for a month. It's rather interesting, Tom, as you say, consumption patterns. It's like, why? I mean, how do you get any rationality out of some of this? Um, Air and gardening. Yeah. I guess it's no, self a survival. Maybe that's it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Victory um, Gardens. Other questions of, of Tom? Senator Brock? Yes. This may be more a general question or general observation rather than something specific for Tom. But, you know, we're talking at a very high level and now saying that, well, things aren't as severe as they appeared before and they may be manageable. But to the citizen who's watching this on YouTube, the question is, well, what does that mean? When we say it's manageable, does that mean that we only have to increase property taxes by 20% instead of 30%? Does it mean that we have to close some schools? Does it mean we have to cut state employee uh, total employment by 2%? Does it mean we have to reduce spending by 8%? And I think it would be useful if we just took a couple of seconds to say, well, what, when we say it's manageable, to what scale? What are we really talking about? about manageable? Is it mildly manageable? Is it serious things that we still have to do that we face? And what are the kinds of things we may be thinking about doing when we come back to deal with this manageable situation? 
I guess I was referring to the sheet that Stephanie put together that would suggest that we can uh, get to a balanced budget for the remainder of this fiscal year um, with um, with a um, uh, with, uh, uh, without experiencing massive uh, kinds of uh, changes. I think it can be done um, within uh, the revenues and. Um, as some people will remember, we do have some reserves as well to help us in this kind of environment. So, um, I, I mean, I obviously, we're looking forward to the to where those reserves are at the end of this yeah. period, and recognizing that there's still a lot of contingencies that having reserves are, are, are critical to to be able to potentially deal with. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And the other thing, um, we know tw 22. This is I'm just talking about you know the remain the three quarters of 21. And so 22 um, is still um, an uncertain future in terms of what that's gonna be, the extent to which we're gonna see um, impact on the stock market. I know people, you know, we were talking with Tom earlier, people are like the banks, but uh, people, if you've got cash, um, you know, keeping it and how that's gonna affect the market, uh, commercial real estate. So there are a whole host of potential impacts that extend beyond the, remaining nine uh, months of, of this current fiscal year. So I, I was, I'm much more short term in my comment on that. So thank you for bringing that up because I think that is, we've got to remember this, just like the first quarter was to get us to um, some sense of what the world was going to be like. Um, and this will get us through the year, but um, there are still a host of unknowns and uncertainties out there. Um, and the issue of planning for at least some of them now and looking forward rather yeah. than narrowly within this particular window, I think is critically important because we're going to be facing those contingencies sooner than, than indeed we think. Yeah. Um, Senator McCormick has got his hand up. Yeah. And then, Thanks. Anne, did you have a comment or something? Well, I just, I, I don't, uh, it's probably for Tom. I don't think these forecasts figure in any future federal aid that can be used to offset lost revenue. There's an awful lot of other things out there that could happen. Well, well, actually they do assume that that will be available, but that's not saying that's how you'll choose to apply okay. that, but it, it actually does assume that there'd be a, a about a $1.5 trillion next round. And that would include uh, unrestricted state and local government money. So without that, this okay. will be worse. Yep, all right. Because you know, there um, will be then these actions that Senator Brock's talking about, you're gonna shed jobs. You know, nationwide state and local governments employ about 13% of all, all workers. In Vermont, it's closer to 15%, which is typical of smaller states where you don't have the same efficiencies across, uh, uh, you know, larger larger population uh, groups. But that's that's a big chunk of uh, income and economic activity in the state. And if there are a lot of layoffs, and you know, aside from the individuals, but the aggregate economic impacts are also uh, uh, can be enormous. So, you know, that's that's still up in the air. Um, um, so that reality, I guess, will keep, <laughs> it's going to be surrounding all of this discussion. Yeah. Uh, Senator Stay McCormick. Tuned. Thanks. Um, understanding that we're, we're going to make uh, budgeting decisions in the coming days, that uh, what we're doing today is just getting a sense of the terrain. Mm -hmm. But in that regard, uh, it seems to me that despite our best efforts in, in May and June, and I think we did a good job knowing that we were going to find flaws because it was unknown territory. I think it's coming to everyone's attention now, various areas where we frankly missed the boat on just particular. I don't know if we did enough for self-employed people. I don't know if we did enough for married couples who are not sole proprietorships or companies with employees, you know, <laughs> that kind of, I think our chambers of commerce uh, are, are in trouble financially. Broadly, Tom, what is our capacity between now and, and, and um, we'll say as we develop the, the rest of the fiscal year's budget, 
what is our capacity to to come up with yet additional aid for the people who we've neglected? It's it's entirely contingent on 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 federal uh, assistance because uh, you know unless you're going to raise money by uh, increasing taxes or cutting spending somewhere and reallocate that money, uh, you know and any capacity you have to assist businesses is flowing from federal dollars. From Washington, yeah. Yeah. So so the whole thing turns on that. So there's, you know, there there's been a lot that's been allocated so far, but there's some that hasn't. Um, yeah. but, but just these unemployment insurance uh, change with the executive order, right now it looks like uh, you know, the state would be required to chip in a uh, hundred dollars a week in order to get the three hundred from uh, the White House, and if that's true, that could cost the state as much as twenty million dollars a month. So if you, you know, if you run that out for for six months or something, you're you know you're down another hundred million dollars. It's just there there are a lot of needs like that, and there's um, uh, you know there's that any capacity is going to stem from federal government transfer payments. That's but we, we did hold back. We didn't spend every every no no at, at the we didn't we, had... we we did not for this very reason because yeah, it's yeah. like we the loss threshold from seventy five to fifty percent right. was based on actual the benefit of experience. So um, we felt it was prudent to have some money, right. but it's as Tom's pointing out, it's because the these are federal dollars that are available to the state. Um, um, that allow us to do it. The need, nevertheless, is going to be yeah. much greater than uh, what we have, unless we get another um, federal bill, and that brings more That's money um, into yep. the state. But um, we did not. And I mentioned we had money set aside um, to help with the K through 12 pressure, but we have. Oh, Stephanie, was it a hundred? It's over a hundred million that we have uh, uh, available. We've got this it's, UI It's, it's just about 200 million. 200 million. So we've got this UI proposal that's just come forward. I know the chamber has, you know, and the single proprietorship and some of that is gonna be up for discussion once we return. Um, yeah. But that 100 million can go very, very quickly as we know. Got the EMTs yet? Yes, we have. That was all taken care of, frankly. Okay. It's just which, bu which bucket they get funded out of in, out of that local um, uh, Buc uh, aid bucket or whether hazardous pay, depending on whether they're municipal or whether they're a, um, a, a, a nonprofit. I just, I wanna make sure that when I, when I tell my constituents, I don't know, I'm making no promises, but we're on it, that I'm not putting them in a fool's paradise. No. <laughs> it's not like the money's all spent. We. No, there might be something for for these people. That's correct. Okay. Senator Starr, you had your hand up. Well, I I was just going to ask the question uh, about the uh, money for sheriffs and local police. Oh, uh, well, I'm I'm gonna. That's in the local government. That's in local government, and I can yeah. explain it. And there's money for county, and it's based on per capita. But if that's not enough for actual expenditures, then the towns all have a, an appropriation. And like the sheriffs, they can build the town. So that, that gets into some of the negotiation. But the money yeah. um, is about $13 million we appropriated to local aid between municipalities and counties. And there was money set aside for waste district costs as well. So that's, that's um, but. There's a lot of confusion around this because we wanted to avoid duplication of responses. And so, Chris, you remember these bring back a lot of conversations that we had when we were putting together that hazard pay proposal and trying to delineate which groups would uh, get the funding through which pot of CRF money. So if you, I can talk to you more about that, Bobby. Yeah, thank you. Okay, but I've already been in touch with Trevor Colby, if that's what you're concerned yep. about. Very. Um, Tom, uh, anything else uh, for Tom? Otherwise, um, 
it's 518 and we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of unknowns ahead of us. Anne, you have any other comments? No, I, this is my third time today. <laughs> Thanks for enduring it. Uh huh. It, it's, um, it, I, I've learned something every time. So um, I think we, we're going to continue to work through. We're not in anywhere near a good position, but it's less worse than when we left in June, the end of June. And um, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns out there. Unfortunately, we might not know what the feds are gonna do until three days before the next election. So um, that's gonna make it difficult, but that's the way it is. We're at the mercy of the federal government and the virus. Um, all right. Well, it's good seeing you, Chris. I've missed you in your um, sunflower yellow um, and- uh, Cheery. Um, yeah, very cheery. Alice and Dick, you're not in your backyard. Bobby, you're in the same place. Um, I more Center Rock, I, I, it looks like a spoon collection in back of you that we get to see. So um, Tom has his books and Senator Westman, you just seem to be white very white. modern white back there. So uh, good to see everyone. And unless there are further questions, yes, Chris, you had a question or comment? No, okay. Then, okay. then we'll, um, uh, we'll ad adjourn.